Both Pakistan and India are celebrating 75 years of independence this week. In 1947, at the end of decades of British rule in India, the country was partitioned, creating two independent nations, Muslim-majority Pakistan and Hindu-majority India. In the years that followed, both have grown economically and in global influence. They've also become nuclear powers and adversaries. Welcome to the What Matters Today podcast from the Geneva Graduate Institute. I'm Dan Graham, Head of Communications at the Institute. In this podcast series, we ask members of our faculty to comment on key global issues. Please note that this podcast episode was recorded on 15 September, a month after the 75th anniversary of the partition. We were hoping to record it earlier, however, scheduling conflicts made it difficult to do so. In 1947, 300 years after British colonization began, Cyril John Radcliffe was assigned the task of drawing the borders to define the two newly independent nation states, India and Pakistan. He had never been east of Paris, nor did he fully understand the gravity of the conclusion he was asked to put forth in just seven weeks' time. On 9 August 1947, he submitted the partition, separating the two nations based upon religious majorities. Put into effect on 17 August 1947, two days after India became independent of the United Kingdom and three days after Pakistan's independence, pandemonium broke out as millions soon found themselves on the wrong side of the new border, creating a lasting legacy of displacement, division, and bloodshed. My guest for this episode of What Matters Today is Gopalan Balachandran, co-director of the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy and professor of international history and politics here at the Geneva Graduate Institute. Professor Balachandran joined the Institute in 2000 from the Delhi School of Economics. His research engages South Asia and the Indian Ocean in a global frame and spans labor, capital, entrepreneurship, and development. He's also interested in histories of colonialism and decolonization and their continuing significance for the present. To set the stage for what's to come, could you briefly explain how the partition came to be? Why did the British decide to draw the border? And what did they hope to accomplish? Well, these are really difficult questions to answer, even in retrospect, after 70 years. What did the British hope to accomplish and why did they do that? Now, the way I come at this is to think of this with the pottery barn metaphor. You know, the pottery barn metaphor, uh, if you break it, you own it. Oh, well, in this case, there's the other side to it, which is that if you can't own it, break it and make sure that no one else can own it. And uh, in brief, that for me is really how I think of uh, the partition of India in uh, 1947, act of colossal historical vandalism or a colossal historical act of vandalism, however you look at it, really coming to pass because the British could no longer hold India and they did not want anyone else, including Indians, to hold India in the manner in which it had come to be by 1947. Looking at it also over the five decades or so preceding 1947, it was the transformation of what was really two-nation theory that the British had assiduously cultivated over uh, from, from about the latter part of the 19th century into really a two-state solution. All right, thanks for that. The withdrawal of the British from India was precipitated by widespread religious massacres. Um, the gore described by one photojournalist was as similar as uh, she had seen at the Buchenwald concentration camp. How did things unravel so quickly between the Muslims and Hindus? And did the colonizers play a role in the religious polarization between the two groups? Absolutely. This has been... A long time in the making, though uh, this is not to say that partition was inevitable. I think after 1857, which, you know, shook British rule in India to its uh, foundations, 
the British began assiduously to cultivate the two-nation theory that I uh, was uh, mentioning to you a moment ago. And uh, basically polarize and calcify identities along religious communal lines in a manner that actually increased their power vis-a-vis the emerging resistance to colonial rule. It's been described as divide and rule. There's a whole historiography about how this operated on the ground. But I think fundamentally historians have agreed that the partition was one of the consequences of the divide and rule policies that the British had followed with respect to India and with respect to lots of other colonies. You know, Ireland is another good example. Uh, Lots of colonies uh, in the course of their uh, colonial rule, which is the reason why I think, in a sense, you know, the effort was to transform these societies in ways that they would become more manageable Mm -hmm. from the point of view of the colonial power. And the transformation that took place in India was in fact to harden Hindu and Muslim religious identities. You know, India was always a plural society, not just with many religions and languages, but these religions did not exist in the form that they eventually emerged in the course of the 20th centuries. There were lots of fracturing identities interrupting these religious identities, but what you see in the course of the early part of the 20th century are these identities identities calcifying into these hardening religious identities. And that's really a product of uh, Britain's divided rule policies. And, and just so what, what was the goal for, for the British to do that? Essentially, from about the early 1900s, there was an increasing uh, demand in India for some form of self-rule. And the question was who would be the rulers of India, the selves uh, ruling India, and how would they stand in relation to British power, and where would British power stand once some form of self-rule began to take hold. So, in effect, I think the British uh, agenda was to effect a political transformation in India in which British power would be indispensable if not as rulers, at least as arbiters between contesting parties. And, you know, that was really key to the divide and rule policy. And, you know, that's something that the British, you know, follow again very assiduously through the first four decades of the uh, 20th century. And it really comes into its own during the Second World War, when on the one hand, large section of the nationalist movement in India begins to resist cooperating with Britain in pursuit of uh, the war, because for many of them, what Britain was doing in India was not that different from what uh, Nazis were attempting in in Europe. And secondly, uh, the loss really of the serious decline of British power in India after the Second World War meant that Britain was in no position to enforce order in India. At the same time, uh, it was in no position to get out in a way that would secure an orderly transition uh, in India. So that was the crisis really of the post-war period that creates an environment in which it begins, uh, you know, partition begins to be imaginable. And in fact, partition becomes the, 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 the best solution for uh, British interests in the subcontinent. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the post-war period, because by the end of the 1940s, the cultural landscape in South Asia had changed drastically. The partition caused the widespread displacement of millions of people, but also the loss of language, traditions, and harmonious living between the Hindus and Muslims. How do people in South Asia identify themselves today? Is there a nostalgia for an undivided India? Absolutely. You know, As I mentioned earlier, India is a land of, you know, many differing and different identities and crisscrossing identities. And uh, what the immediate effect of the partition, of course, was to calcify these identities along, you know, religious communal lines. At the same time, I think in their own different ways, people resisted partition. You know, we kind of think of partition as having taken place at one stroke in 1947. 
That's not quite how it happened. Partition begins to take shape over the next two, almost two and a half decades. You know, until about 1965, it was relatively easy. Until 1953, Indians and Pakistanis did not even need passports to cross the border. You know, at the height of the partition, you could move across, uh, in, uh, across the border without any documents. After 1953, it was extremely easy for people on both sides to cross the border with visas that were easily available. It was not until really the mid-1960s and more so from about 1971 that, you know, the, 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 the partition erected these boundaries that became impossible more or less uh, to cross, you know. Trade suffered, you know, uh, people-to-people contacts, transport and communication networks, all these begin to crumble. So you have almost two generations after partition with strong memories of life before, trying to keep those memories alive through, you know, renewing contacts and, and so on. This despite, you know, the nearly two million people who were killed during the partition, you know, the horrible, hor- horrific violence that took place, this notwithstanding the, you know, nearly 20 million people who are estimated to have been displaced by the partition. The horrors of the partition notwithstanding for the first two generations after 1947, the effort was really somehow to keep the ties across the border alive. It's only from the 1970s with the hardening of these religious identities into, you know, nationalist political movements in both countries that you begin to see the partition being realized. Mm -hmm not just between the two countries, but also within the two countries, right? You know, once you draw a border, there's no reason to expect the border to stay where you've drawn it. You know, it kind of shrinks and encloses you. And that's exactly what happens in the decades since, in the, you know, 50 years since about 1970. Wow, very interesting. And uh, final question here is uh, perhaps the most sensitive part of the partition is that Kashmir, which is predominantly Muslim, remains a part of Hindu-dominant India. It almost seems like an open wound, a relic of colonialism's recklessness that may never heal. Is the division too deep between the two nations to leave room for peace? You know, that's hard to say. You're right. You know, Kashmir has been an open wound in the subcontinent and, uh, and India and Pakistan have gone to war more than once over Kashmir. And the Kashmiri people themselves have suffered enormously because of the confrontation between India and Pakistan over Kashmir. Both countries seem to claim the land, but don't seem to want the people, right? Which is a great tragedy. You know, in the early 2000s, there were efforts to kind of recognize the realities of Kashmir, that it's divided now between uh, India and Pakistan. A portion of Kashmir also lies with uh, China. And that somehow we need to make life easier in Kashmir, that we should promote contacts across the border. So instead of making Kashmir the the divide, make it the bridge between the two countries. Enormously, uh, you know, imaginative diplomacy in, you know, between roughly 2003 and uh, 2007. But, you know, nothing, uh, in the end, nothing came of it because uh, you had... uh, a lot of forces also arrayed against the two countries coming together and uh, living in peace. So I won't give up hope. I, I don't think that, you know, the divide is so deep that, um, you know, it, it's, it's not going to be healed. And in fact, I think Kashmir could really be a bomb more than the open wound uh, that uh, clearly seems to be right now. You mentioned uh, nostalgia, right? You know, for the new generations, you know, who have no memories of having lived together and who have only heard from their parents and grandparents about life on either side of the border. You know, there is a, there is a new generation that sees how, how alike people in the two countries are uh, rather than different. This is one of the things, perhaps, that nationalist politicians on both sides want to prevent which is for the people to recognize how alike they are rather than how different. But, you know, social media, you know, entertainment channels, television, music, you know, Pakistani music is enormously popular in India. 
Pakistani soaps, <laughs> you know, are captivating Indian audiences. Uh, for a long time, Indian films right. uh, used to be popular in India until Indian films became increasingly jingoistic. And there are people outside India, especially in the United States and Britain, who are again uh, forming uh, bridges between uh, people of the two countries. That said, you know, you also have uh, the, you know, upsurge of the kind of uh, extreme nationalism that you see in both countries, increasingly more so in India now uh, than in Pakistan. So it remains to be seen how events unfold in the coming years and decades. But, at, you know, I'm optimistic and I'm hoping that uh, the two countries will come together to live in peace. No, that's great. It's great to end on a hopeful note like that. So, Bala, thank you so much for being part of this podcast episode. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. That was Professor Gopalan Balachandran discussing the partition of India. This podcast series is produced by the Geneva Graduate Institute Communications team. For more information about the Institute, please visit our website at graduateinstitute.ch. I'm Dan Graham. Thanks for listening.